Hello and welcome to Jenny Designs with Paper, Crime and Coloring, Episode 2. First, the coloring. I have selected a W plus 9 Kind Soul stamp set for the coloring this week, and I will be putting a piece of Nina Classic Crest Solar White cardstock 80 pound weight into my Misty stamp position. Once I figure out where I am going to stamp the image, I can pick the image up with the lid of my Misty and get ready to ink that. I did opt for straight up and down because I feel like it had more uses that way. And I'm going to be inking it up with um, Simon Says Stamp Intense Black Ink. This is a Copic friendly ink. So, and I will be using my Copic markers again this week. I will stamp this image twice because I did not get enough ink and pressure on the stamen of the flowers for a clear image. To color this image, I have selected two shades of greens or two green families for the leaves, a group of markers in the pink family and a group of markers in the yellow family for the coloring. I chose three markers in each family set, but at the end I added a fourth pink and a fourth yellow so that I could get that um, look I was looking for, highlights and low lights. So now that we're done with the coloring details, let's move into our story time. This week we are focusing on the second alphabetical state in the United States, which is Alaska. However, Alaska didn't become a full-fledged state until 1959, and most of the crime there is relatively new and kind of well-known. So I cheated just a little bit and went back, like back before Texas was a state. And to be fair, the criminal I'm talking about today did not was not born in Alaska and committed crimes outside Alaska, but he was also a criminal in Alaska and he died in Alaska. So let's get on to our story. Our story is about, let me get his names in the right order, Jefferson Randolph Smith II, AKA Soapy Smith. Now, Soapy was born to Jefferson Randolph Smith I and Emily Dawson Edmonds Smith. He was born in Coweta County, Georgia, near the town of Newman in 1860. His father's family were English. The Smiths had come to America around 1760 and settled into Virginia. His grandfather was a plantation owner and a Georgia legislature, and his father was an attorney. In 1821, Jeffrey, Soapy's grandfather moved his family to Coweta County, Georgia, and that is where Soapy was born. The Civil War destroyed much of the wealth that the family had amassed, and they struggled during the Reconstruction years to adjust. Um, Soapy's grandfather was a plantation owner. Okay, he did not. The Reconstruction was not kind to him. So, in about 1876, when Soapy was about 16 years old, his parents gathered up all of their belongings and moved to Round Rock, Texas. Now, in 1876, Texas was kind of the edge of the West, and it was the Wild West, and it was everything you know, everything you see in Western movies, right? Um, Soapy's mother died about a year later when he was 17, and this was about the same time that Soapy began his career as a confidence man. Okay? He was introduced to the world of the Bunko Brotherhood, which is another word, as far as I can tell, for a group of people who travel together and are con men. Typically speaking, in that time, con men would travel singly. They would inflict their con on people around them that they came in contact with and then they would move on. Soapy kind of changed that dynamic for him and the group of people that were working with him. So he traveled and operated his confidence swindles, his cons all across the Western United States. But he is most famous for having a major hand in organized crime in Denver and Creedy, Colorado, or Creed, Colorado. And then on to Alaska. So from 1879 to 1898, he was in Denver. And Denver and Crete, they're kind of the same. He kind of went back and forth between the two. In Denver, he had saloons, gambling halls, cigar, cigar stores. He had auction houses that specialized in cheating his clientele. And 
It was in Denver that Soapy began to make a name for himself across the war, the country, the whole United States, as a bad dude. Denver was also where he entered into the arena of political fixing, where he, for favors, he could sway the outcome of city and county and state elections, clear to the state. He used the same kind of operations in Creed that he did in Denver and in Skagway, Alaska. He used the same processes over and over again to create this kind of very robust and very um, protected group of crime, group of criminals. Um, Soapy had a gift for organizing people. When he was in Texas, he began to form this core of his bunco gang that became known as the all across the West as the Soap Gang. And he, he chose a very specific group of smart confidence men or con men. Each man that he chose for his gang had their own unique and specialized talents. They, they um, all had a different con that they inflicted upon their victims. And like I said before, most of the time these men would drift along from, state, from town to town by themselves but Soapy was able to unite these men together into an organization and they became harder and harder to stop. Soapy combined all of their assets together so that they could bribe policemen and politicians and also were able to purchase then the best legal representation in the area. He successfully made it more and more difficult to keep his men in jail and he found that the idea of law and order actually worked in his favor. Now, one of the men in Soapy's gang was his cousin, Edwin Bobo. And Edwin was known to be a swindler in Fort Worth that, um, he was the reason that Fort Worth created laws specifically targeting con men. One of the earliest con cons that Soapy is known for was in Creed, Colorado, and he somehow obtained a 10 foot statue of a primitive looking human being that he buried secretly outside the town of Creed. Then he quote, uncovered the statue and was this huge public thing. And he was, ex he was charging exorbitant fees for people to come and see this new found fossil or, uh, you know, this, this new thing and then snuck out of town before anybody realized that he hadn't found it. He had buried it there. Okay. So on to his nickname, this is how he earned the nickname Soapy. And this was one of his more common, um, cons that he adapted no matter where he lived. So he would open up. So they ha he had this thing called a tripe and keister which is a display case on a tripod. And he would stamp this case up on a quarter corner in the city and he would get cakes of soap. And he would put the soap on top of this stand. And as he's showing it, he's, he's telling people, hey, come look, hey, come look, hey, come look. And while the crowd of onlookers is there, he would open his wallet and start wrapping money around the soap bars of soap. And he would wrap a dollar and then a hundred dollars around these bars of soap. And then he would wrap the soap in regular paper to hide the money. And when everybody was all excited about, you know, the opportunity to get this money wrapped package, he would sell each person the opportunity to buy a cake of soap wrapped in money. So he would charge them a dollar and they would get to pick any bar of soap they wanted, right? Kind of like the, um, which, which shell is the nut under, right? <laughs> okay. So he would have in the crowd, one of his own men planted who would buy the bar of soap that had some money in it, tear it open and wave it around and show it to the crowd and get all excited. And then more and more money, more and more people would buy soap, hoping to get that, that bar of soap with the money in it, especially the hundred dollar bill. So more often than not, 
these victims, these regular people, bought several bars of soap. And then midway through the sale, Soapy would announce that the $100 bill was still in the pile of unpurchased soap. So then he would auction off the rest of the bars of soap to the highest of bidders. Through manipulation and sleight of hand, he had hidden the cakes of soap wrapped with money and replaced them with packages that held no cash. The only money won went to members of the gang who'd been planted into the crowd pretending to win in order to increase sales. On one occasion, Smith was arrested by a policeman named John Hall for running his soap selling racket. And while writing the in the police logbook, Holland had forgotten Smith's first name and wrote Soapy. And that's how he got his nickname, Soapy Smith. And he became known as Soapy Smith all across the Western United States. Soapy stated that he first arrived in Denver, Colorado sometime in 1879. And he liked Denver's wide open policy toward gambling. The lack of being able to keep up with its own, gam own growth made Denver a haven for bunco gangs. The Union Station train depot was busy day and night bringing in fresh victims, which were called sheep, <laughs> from the, by the bunco gangs. Soapy combined many of the loosely lit bunco men working in the city into his organization, and his influence at the city hall and police department grew along with the size of his gang. Soapy's younger brother, Bascom Smith, joined the gang and operated a cigar store that was a front for a dishonest poker games and other swindles operating in one of the back rooms. Other operations included fraudulent lottery shops, sure thing stock exchanges, fake watch and bogus diamond auctions, and the sale of stocks in non-existent businesses. Because of the bribes, some of the police officers patrolling the streets would not arrest Soapy or members of his gang. Other officers feared Soapy's quick and violent anger. Occasionally, Soapy or one of his men would be arrested. Friends, attorneys, and associates were always ready to obtain their quick release from jail. A voting fraud trail after the municipal elections of 1889 focused attention on corrupt ties and payoffs between Soapy, the mayor, and the chief of police, a combination referred to in local newspapers as the firm of Londoner. The mayor lost his job, but Soapy remained untouched, and Soapy, Soapy's power grew to the point that he had admitted to the press that he was a con man and saw nothing wrong with it. In 1896, he told the newspaper reporter, I consider Bunko steering more, steering more honorable than a life led by the average politician. So he is fully admitting in public, in print, but yes, I am a con man, and I think that is a more honorable profession than a politician. I'm not sure I disagree, but dude, they're both criminals, right? <laughs> okay, in 1884, Soapy was able to proclaim himself boss of Denver's underworld, Empire of Crime. Newspapers in Denver reported that he controlled the city's criminals and underworld gambling, accused corrupt politicians and the police chief of receiving money from him, and eventually Soapy and his brother became too well-known, and even the most corrupt city officials could no longer protect them. So his bragging started getting him into trouble. Their influence in, Denver, in their Denver-based empire began to crumble when they were charged with attempted murder for the beating of a saloon manager. Bascom was jailed, but Soapy escaped and became wanted in Colorado. Lou Blonger and his brother Sam, rivals of the soap gang, acquired his former control of Denver's criminals. All right, so here we are, and he can no longer stay in, Den in Colorado, and he has to find somewhere else to go, right? Well, this is about the same time that the Klondike Gold Rush began in Alaska. And in 1897, Soapy moved his operations to Dye and Skagway, Alaska. His first attempt at occupying Skagway ended in total failure when miners' committees encouraged him to leave the area 
after operating his three-card Monty and P and Shell games on the White Pass Trail for less than a month. So he traveled back east. He went to St. Louis. He went to Washington, D.C., and he did not return to Skagway, Alaska until 1898. This time, Soapy set up his... Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? He was prepared to set up an entire criminal organization. Okay, he was he he had the beginning of a third empire, and he started it the same way that he had in Denver and Creed, Colorado. He put the town's deputy marshal on his payroll, and he began collecting allies for a takeover of the town. Soapy opened a fake telegraph office in which the wires only went as far as the wall. Nobody even checked to see if there were telegraph wires outside of his building. Not only did the telegraph office obtain fees for sending messages, and I'm using air quotes here like you can see me, because how far could they be sent? But also, cash-laden victims soon found themselves losing even more money playing in poker games with their new friends, again, quotes. Because, like, these poker games were not on the up and up. <laughs> Telefo telegraph lines did not actually reach or leave Skagway, Alaska until 1901. Soapy opened a saloon and named, he, and he named it Jeff Smith's Parlor. And he opened that in March of 1898. And it became the office of his um, empire to run his criminal operations. And even though Skagway already had a municipal building, his saloon became known as the Real City Hall. So his success eventually angered a lot of the honest citizens of Skagway who were trying to build an upstanding community. And they formed a vigilante, vigilante committee of 101. That was the name of it, Committee of 101, in an attempt to bring law and order to the town. Smith obviously didn't care and he formed his own gang and it was called the Committee of 303 to oppose them. On July 7th, 1898, John Douglas Stewart, he was a miner, came into Skagway with a sack of gold valued at $2,700. In today's money, that is almost $100,000. Three of Soapy's gang members convinced him to play a game of three card Monty. Um, Stewart lost and he didn't want to pay for his losses. So these three men grabbed the sack of money and ran. The Vigilante Committee 101 demanded that Soapy return the gold, but he refused, claiming that Stewart had lost it fairly. And I'm using air quotes again because there's no such thing as fair in a game of three card Monty. On the evening of July 8th, the Vigilante Committee organized a meeting on the Juno Wharf. Smith, however, failed to realize just how angry the vigilantes were and when he tried to break through the crowd, a Skagway city engineer named Frank Reed confronted him. With a Winchester rifle draped over his shoulder, Soapy argued with Reed, who was one of four guards blocking his way down the wharf. The men exchanged harsh words and then bullets. Frank Reed shot Soapy Smith dead on the spot, but not before Smith had badly wounded him. Soapy's last words were, my God, don't shoot. Too late. Soapy died on the spot with a bullet to the heart. He also received a bullet in his left leg and a severe wound in the left arm by the elbow. Frank Reed died 12 days later with a bullet in his leg and groin area. The three gang members who robbed Stewart received jail sentences. Soapy Smith was buried several yards outside the city cemetery. The funeral services for Soapy Smith were held in Skagway Church, and he had donated the funds to help build this church. The minister chose as the text for his sermon a line from Proverbs 13, which reads, The way of transgressors is hard. That seems a fitting eulogy for a man who spent his entire adult life hunting and swindling people in the western United States, including clear up into Alaska. I'm just touching up my coloring here, and I didn't remember to get markers out to color the center, so I imagine I will have to finish that at a later time. Let me know if you think this was cheating to choose a crime that happened before Alaska was technically a state. 
Um, let me know how you feel about the story. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Leave me a comment. I love to get comments and I would love any interaction you can provide with my video. I do have a couple of photos here for you. One of Jeff Jefferson, Soapy Smith, and one of his gang. Thank you so much for stopping by. I have included a couple more videos here for you to watch as well as a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Thank you so much for stopping by and as always, have a really fabulous day.